Good afternoon. Walter Edgar, continuing our, our conversations on South Carolina history. And with our last conversation, we were talking about the first New South in South Carolina, when southern states and cities began to industrialize. That was considered a sign of progress uh, and activity. And who owned these textile mills? Because we're really talking about textile mills in South Carolina. Um, Although by the time you get to World War I, about a third of them were owned by out-of-state interests. Two-thirds were owned by South Carolinians, and many of them, particularly in the 1880s, excuse me, 1890s and early 1900s, were put together by town leaders, and basically they took up a collection and built mills. And that was true, particularly in places like Greenwood and Newberry. But bringing of the mills caused some unease among town dwellers. South Carolina's town residents were becoming truly Victorian, and they were very concerned with morality and civic virtue. Until the 1890s, town folk had only been concerned about what they called the Negro problem. But by the early 20th century, their focus had changed. They were concerned about what they called the male problem and they're really talking about the men and women who worked in the mills. Mills recruited upcountry whites in South Carolina and then expanded to Tennessee, North Carolina, and Georgia in an attempt to find a labor force. While males were not the best workers and used to independence, and they were not used to taking orders, sometimes they resented their employers, and they certainly resented patronizing heirs of town folks because there were stereotypes. They appeared in print and they certainly were verbalized. Who were these white men coming to work in the mills? Working for somebody else. They were not independent. They were probably yeoman farmers who had fallen on hard times, but if they'd fallen on hard times, you know, it was really their fault. They were landless whites, sharecroppers or tenants, and thereby they were shiftless, you know, and not quite trustworthy. Otherwise, they'd have been landowners. Typical was the attitude expressed by a young woman in Greenwood who said it was a disgrace to work in the mill. In Greenville, town folk crossed the street so as not to share sidewalks with lint heads and bobbin dodgers. In Rock Hill, there were three separate school systems below the high school level. One for town whites, one for African Americans, and one for mill whites. And that continued well into the 20th century. What had developed was what the Abbeville newspaper editor called a caste between our race. And he feared that would be the result of industrialization. And he was correct because town folk consider themselves good Anglo-Saxons, but the operatives were rude, rowdy, lazy, crude, with filthy habits, poor, uneducated, unhealthy, a threat to the progressive white towns of South Carolina. And then there were the mill villages, many not too different from what uh, were described in the expose stories of out of El Tarbell and others in uh, the muckrakers in the late 19th and early 20th century. In fact, Columbia's Olympia Mill Village was the subject of a muckraking expose that was actually endorsed by President Teddy Roosevelt. Some, such as the upcountry town of Pelzer, were model communities. In fact, that mill village had electricity in operatives' homes, and the workers were called operatives, not mill workers, before more prosperous town folk in Charleston and Columbia. But after the age of 12, children had to work in the mill unless excused. Mill housing was often decided on how many hands were employed in the mill, thus encouraging child labor. So, by that I mean if you had the size of your house depended upon how many people in that family were going to work in the mill.
mill housing based upon that encouraged child labor. Workers were sometimes paid in loonies, coins made out of brass, redeemable at the company's store. Now, what were they earning at the turn of the last century? Wages ranged, and this is for a 60 hour week, and this is in today's dollars, ranged between $131 and $160 a week. That comes out to about $2.17 or $2.66 per hour. The minimum wage in South Carolina today is $7.25. So it wasn't even quite a third of what the minimum wage were. And that was for adult males. Women and children were paid less. And South Carolina wage earners received 60% less than those in New England for the same hours and the same jobs. Mill whistles or bells, that timetable for entire community, not just the mills. In the 1880s, the work week was 69 hours. It was reduced to 66 in the 1890s and in 1907 to 60 hours. Town folk usually supported mill owners and state politicians while they railed about New York banks, railroads, and insurance companies. But let some do-gooders suggest the conditions in the mills and there were shrieks and screams and hysterics. Daniel Tompkins, a native of South Carolina who went to Charlotte, moved to Charlotte, and became editor of the Observer, compared anybody who complained about life in the mills as antebellum abolitionists worse. He considered anyone who even questioned regulating child labor as being un-American. Interestingly, by the early 20th century, there were a number of South Carolinians who were interested and concerned with child labor, its impact on family life, its effect on the health and welfare of children. The state newspaper was a major crusader to regulate child labor. In South, in 1903, South Carolina passed a law that no child under 10 could be employed in a mill. Um, in 1904, it was age 11. In 1905, it was age 12. But the law was not always observed. Progressives, part of the civic improvement in the New South, education was at the top of the list. Schools were underfunded and understaffed. Illiteracy was still a scandal. In 1895, 45% of the state's population over the age of 10 could neither read nor write. The majority of children attended school for less than 90 days a year and thousands for fewer than 30 days. In 1910, a report on schools for the State Department of Education said there were only 13 proper high schools in the entire state of South Carolina. And they were located in Abbeville, North Augusta, Anderson, Van Berg, two in Charleston, Darlington, Somerville, Johnston, Marion, Mullins, and Bennettsville. Know what's missing? Columbia, Florence, Aiken, Greenville, Spartanburg. And all of those 13 proper high schools only graduated 250 students a year. Civic improvement was something else that the progressives wanted. A city professional man or businessman, that was the definition. But in South Carolina, it was the role of women that was crucial to progressive, the progressive movement. They often provided the initiative, the funding, and the leadership in education, health, and community beautification parks. Charleston, they established the Women's Exchange for Work. They funded the public health nurse in Dillon County, uh, the Newberry Library League, the Darlington, the Darlington Civic League, which was also about a library, and in Columbia, the Ridgewood Camp, the State Sanatorium for Tuberculosis. Because, of course, South Carolina did not believe it had a responsibility to provide hospital for tuberculosis victims who were just thrown out on the street. 
but thanks to the women of Colombia and particularly the Daughters of the Holy Cross of Trinity Church, the state got its first TB camp. Women's clubs, like everything else in South Carolina, were segregated. Both black and white worked for their respective communities, but there were two South Carolinas. The Federation of Colored Women's Clubs had the motto of lifting as we climb, and their major project at the turn of the last century was the fair walled home for orphaned, abused, or delinquent young women, because the state of South Carolina had a home for white male juvenile delinquents, for black male juvenile delinquents, for wayward white girls, but nothing for African American girls. And so the Federation of Women's Club, with interestingly one of their strongest supporters and patrons, was Bishop Kirkman Finley of the Episcopal Church. He was, he helped them secure funding when it was needed. And while the Fairwall Home still existed, he served on its board and their major conference room was named after him when he died. And then we have the Women's Christian Temperance Unit. It was successful in getting the state finally to adopt prohibition, but it also talked about suffrage and there were separate women's suffrage clubs all over the state. Remember, we just celebrated the 100th anniversary of women obtaining the right to vote. In Columbia, Ida Sally Reamer, the daughter-in-law of Mayor William Reamer and the sister of Mayor Goodwin Red of Charleston, uh, participated in suffragist parades with her young daughter. And the two men, the mayors of the largest city, did not speak to her for six months because she was disgracing the family. The Pulitzer Sisters of Charleston were active in national efforts and lobbied in Nashville when Tennessee became the 36th state to adopt the 19th Amendment. And South Carolina, of course, rejected the amendment, 93 to 21 in the House and 32 to 3 in the Senate. Once the 19th Amendment became the law of the land, South Carolina, through the General Assembly, altered the law so that women could not serve on juries because voters, voter rolls were the source of jury. Because, and I quote, respectable women had no real desire to be jurors, and it was up to the General Assembly to protect the weaker sex from the unpleasantness of jury duty. That was true until the 1960s. And then, Let's just look at the population as a whole. People are trying to make reform. They're talking about putting in waterworks. They're talking about putting in schools, roads, electricity. At the turn of the last century, when the Spanish-American War broke out, one-third of the state's volunteers, all men, were rejected for health reasons. And in Greenville and Newberry counties, the rejection rate was 45%. Now, under health is also included mental health, and that probably covers illiteracy, but that's a striking statistic. Mill Villages was described by the State Board of Health as pest holes for the corruption of the whole state, and mill workers literally fought officials to prevent inoculation of their children for smallpox, which was supported by the management. That was in the town of Union. Charleston was also a pest hole until the early years of the 20th century. Pigs and buzzards still foraged the streets. The buzzards were called Charleston turkeys. Cows were kept in, bas in backyards to sell unpasteurized milk to the poor. Typhoid fever and yellow fever outbreaks were common. And there were 12,000 leaking privies in the city, which will tell you about the quality of the drinking water. This was gradually corrected in the years before World War I. Violence was sadly a common part of everyday life. Murders and lynchings continued unabated. In 1897, the legislature reduced penalties for carrying concealed weapons. One judge said, the deplorable custom of carrying pistols 
the custom carried to such an extent that our state may be regarded as an armed camp in times of peace. Members of the state's congressional delegation in the 1890s, four of the seven men had killed a man. Young men, black and white, rich and poor, considered pistols a necessary part of their everyday outfits. During the first decade of the 20th century, national homicide, the national homicide rate was 7.2 per 100,000. Memphis was the murder capital of the USA, but Charleston was the second. In 1906, there were twice as many murders in South Carolina as in the city of Chicago, which had a much larger population. Accused murderers were brought to trial. They were rarely convicted. The most famous, of course, being Lieutenant Governor James Tillman, who was acquitted by a jury of gunning down the editor of the state newspaper in cold blood right at the corner of Maine and Gervais. After 1900, the state and the News and Courier, the two largest newspapers in South Carolina, became outspoken opponents of lynching. Same for the State Bar Association, which campaigned against what it called the rule of the mob and the pocket pistol. Some progress was made until Coleman Blees was elected governor, and he served from 1911 to 1915. He openly endorsed lynching as necessary and good, and he said he would pardon any male operative who killed a physician for examining his daughter without parental consent. Blees turned out the vote. The mill workers and Charleston voters carried him into office. When Blees was running for office, whether you liked him or not, the voter turnout in South Carolina was about 80%. We haven't even come close in the 21st century. He was misunderstood. He did have a program. People said he didn't have a program. He didn't work to protect the mill workers. He did have a program. Get the government off the backs of the people. The voice of the voiceless. The mill operatives. And that was the term that he used. He was crude. He was vocal. He shocked decent whites, even more than Ben Tillman had. But he was governor. He resigned five days before his term was over so he wouldn't have to shake hands with his successor, Richard I. Manning, who was the grandfather of our own fellow resident, Bernard Manning. Richard I. Manning was the state's best governor, and I don't just mean then. In the entire history of South Carolina, Richard I. Manning was the best governor this state has ever had. He proposed a dozen pieces of legislation. He overhauled the tax structure, equalizing assessments. He increased funding for education. He created a board of arbitration to try to solve labor disputes. He created the board of charities and corrections, which reformed the asylum and the prisons, outlawed child labor under the age of 14, created the State Highway Commission, which began to have paved highways. He improved markets and agricultural education for farmers, and schools for the mentally ill were established. He demonstrated that government could be good and help South Carolina, something that was part of the state's political philosophy until the 1980s. I was going to read Governor Manning, but I have misfiled it. I'm an absent-minded professor, I'm sorry. Um, but Richard I. Manning really was the epitome of the New South in South Carolina. And that's pretty short. I'm sorry, I thought I had more to go than that. Is that okay? So. That's just 20, 25 minutes. Okay. You want to give me an ending? Yeah. Um, all right, that concludes our discussion of South Carolina and the first New South. When we have our conversation next week, we'll talk about South Carolina, World War I, and the onset of the Great Depression, which occurred in this state in 1920.
1929. Thank you.